and welcome to the latest AppLearn podcast. My name is Andrew Barlow and I'm the Director of Product Strategy here at AppLearn. And it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Showers, the COO and co-founder of Knowledge Source Consulting, also known as KSI. Scott's spent the the last 25 years uh, helping some of the world's largest organizations implement uh, and transform their organizations using digital technologies. Uh, Previously at uh, at Towers Watson, Scott has a big interest in digital transformation and uh, it's close to his heart to help organizations adopt transformational change. Scott, it's a pleasure to have you uh, on the Upland podcast. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate the opportunity. Scott, I always love uh, speaking to you because uh, you always <laughs> always say to me uh, how uh, oh well, you always apologize for being so direct and uh, always say that it's an Americanism. But I do love how direct you are, and you know I'm hoping that a lot of that's going to come across in today's podcast. Yeah, I wouldn't expect anything else. I, as as I said to you, uh, the the British tend to apologize for apologizing. Um, so I actually quite like uh, being direct and open and transparent. So um, yeah, really really looking forward to this. In terms of uh, in terms of the the scope of this session, uh, Scott, what I'm really interested in, what the the listeners are really interested in here is 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 your sort of expertise and experiences in and in and out of uh, digital transformation. You know, you spent a lot of years both at Towers Watson and now. Uh, more recent KSI, helping some of the world's largest organizations implement digital technologies. And from our perspective, we're interested in in understanding, you know, your sort of experiences and, you know, some of your suggestions and uh, anticipations really for the future of what uh, digital technologies can bring to, to enterprise. But what I'm really interested in touching on, first of all, is you recently undertook a survey for uh, your annual, third annual survey for the Workday Customer Experience. Is that right? Workday Customer Experience Survey? Yep, that is correct, Andy. We... Um had noticed that there was a void of information from a client perspective about their experiences uh, in regards to technical transformation, adoption, and implementation <clears throat> of the products that are out there today. Certainly, there's Gartner reports, there's Forrester reports that talk a lot about feature functionality. We really felt uh, Bob Crow uh, was really the driver behind a lot of this. It's his compiled, so I have to give him credit. We really felt like it was important to capture the voice of customers. And and what type of organizations participated in the survey? And I know that obviously there are they were all workday customers. You know, give us an idea of the type of scale. Yeah, we broke we break um, our company sizes into four tranches. Uh, one is up to four thousand. Uh, number two is between four thousand and ten. Number three is between ten and twenty five thousand. And the fourth tranche is twenty five thousand and above. Um, we had a very uh, of the two hundred and ten. I think we had a nice. Uh, even distribution across those four tranches, not necessarily on purpose. That's just the way it worked out. And we also, of those 210 unique organizations um, that responded in the survey, it hit probably 13 to 14 different industries from education all the way through oil and gas. Really, really a nice representation of work-based customer base. And, and I'm, a, I'm right in thinking that's 213 companies total. Correct. That is accurate. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing cross-section of, of Workday customers. And I guess really that's why, you know, we were so interested in, in sharing some of the key points from the survey uh, on the latest Apple and podcast. You mentioned a number of different industries. Uh, I understand that a lot of healthcare and edu- education organizations that are investing in these types of technologies. Is that something that you're seeing also? We are. We are. We're seeing a lot in the inter- entertainment industry as well. Hospitality also. A lot of synergy and a lot of growth in those particular verticals. But from KSI's perspective, you, you know, you, obviously you work with Workday and, and we're, we're here to predominantly talk about the, the customer survey, but KSI, you know, as an organization, you know, it works, it's, it's a multi, multi-talented, multi-technology talented practice, right? That is correct. So we, we are an agnostic firm from an advisory perspective, meaning that we don't align with any one specific technology product. Um, we've got experience across all of the major products and platforms, and several of the second tier products as well. And what? And what? And in just just for I guess for the audience's perspective, you know your the sort of key services that KSI provide. Uh, what what do you really specialize in in, in supporting Workday and other you know other technology customers? 
Yeah, good question, Andy. So our we're really uh, we provide experience based consulting around four primary pillars. The first being vendor or product evaluation and selection. So we help clients um, determine if they are in the market for a new cloud based product or or really on prem product. They could use utilize us as well, but we help them select the proper product. We provide client side program management and support services. Obviously, change or digital adoption and, and change management. And then service delivery, design, and implementation as well. Those last three really, from beginning to end, should probably align together. It's almost a spider web of activity because without one, you struggle with the other. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think <clears throat> what's interesting to see is that um, you know the amount of uh, organizations in the market that are investing in digital technologies is you know overwhelming. It's it's grown rapidly. You know, I saw some figures. Uh, saying that that was going to rise to 164 billion by 2020 investment in digital transformation. I guess from what I'm seeing is organisations like KSI critical to the success of you know these implementations not only going smoothly but ultimately delivering the intended return on investment. So you know that's why we we like talking to people like yourself, experts like yourself, really, and also partners like yourselves to to really get your view on how how businesses are embracing uh, these technologies and and whether they. Uh, whether they, the actual implementation of them is uh, ultimately successful. Yeah, Andy, that's a that's a that's a really good point. I think from our perspective, as we're seeing those numbers and and getting into the, I believe you mentioned 160 billion dollars. I think what's fascinating is that the term transformation is somewhat taken on a a negative connotation, and, and really, I, I think it depends on how you define that word. We define that word, and we've evolved over the years, but we've we've defined that word to mean aligning with specific intent for the enablement that the digital technology allows you to expand upon. So I, I think in many instances, in the earlier years of some of the new products that are out there and the look and feel and the modern approach that, that is there today, um, a lot of folks just wanted to to lift and shift technology. I think when they are making these investments today, there is a, an actual intent of behavior change. And that's why change and, and adoption is so important. And, and we're starting to see a redefinition of some of those terms um, as this increase in volume of, of digital technologies evolves. Yeah. And, and, um, and the great thing about that today is that we're going to actually see that through data. You know, I mean, I spend a lot of time speaking to industry experts and industry practitioners like yourself, and um, we talk, you know, about our experiences and predictions for the future. But looking at actual customer feedback and, uh, you know, and data is, you know, is tremendously powerful. I'm sure that uh, our listeners will be will be interested in that. So, so let's jump straight in. Then I think, you know, what I would be interested in is what if if I was to ask you, uh, you know, what the top sort of five key findings really from the survey what would you what would you say they were yeah that's a that's a great question i think the first and foremost speed speed to go live has become a, a key driver of these projects over the past 24 to 36 months but customers are really struggling to meet the timelines required to meet that speed component i think a lot of that has been driven or or the, the data shows and, and some of the commentary provided by our respondents um, that's really being driven by cost and, and subscription terms. And in many cases, the expedited timeline has resulted in a renegotiation of go-live dates or a change in scope for initial launch. Organizations of all sizes right now are operating on a minimal staff with minimal staff and, and streamlined budgets. I mean, in a lot of instances for the systems that we see, these are back office, back office products. And because they're not necessarily revenue drivers, uh, they don't get the same amount of spend or attention that a revenue driving product would. So there's really a, maybe in, in some instances, maybe once every 10 years, once every 20 years, you really have to make the most out of this. I, I think because these organizations or the data is showing us and commentary showing us that because these organizations are operating with minimal staff and budget, that it's hard for them to live up to what's required of implementation partners to meet the difficult timelines in a speed to go live scenario. They either don't have the capacity, and in a lot of cases, they don't have the subject matter expertise. Um, I would say the third primary finding would be that in hindsight, the vast majority of clients didn't feel like they were truly ready 
to engage in the implement with the implementation partner. I, I would say that that's really from a decision making perspective. Many of these products require a thought shift and a thorough understanding of that thought shift, and that impacts decision making and certainly impacts how the business or how partnering with the business can function. The fourth probably finding I would say, customers didn't necessarily realize that implementation partners were there to configure based on their decisions and not there to consult on best practice or manage customer resources. Um, the good news all in all of this, really the fifth thing that I think we found um, specific to Workday was that a very high percentage, uh, their customer base really is confident and Workday is highly regarded from a product perspective as well as from an organization. The company itself has really lived up to the commitments that they've made or that they make during the sales process and customers appreciate that. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think uh, I think it's, you know, a very good point it, that, you know, Workday in, in terms of product, you know, just my, my personal stance on it is, um, you know, it's it's a tremendously powerful uh, technology and uh, it's, you know, it's got to be one of the more intuitive technologies, in my opinion, although intuitivity is in the eye of the beholder, uh, because I, I might find something intuitive and somebody else may not. But I think um, I think in the round, it, it, it tends to look like that. Workday, you know, I'm really impressed with, with Workday's customer success. They, you know, they really, really, really focus on making their customers successful. But it comes back to... To, to really, uh, you know, so once two of those key points that you made there in and around, you know, change in, in, in and around readiness and also having the resources internally to actually uh, deliver these types of programs. Um, interestingly, from from the survey, um, you know, I noticed that that 19 percent of the organizations surveyed actually didn't um, hit their achieved target adoption rates. And we'll come on to that term in a minute. My my view on that. Uh, is adoption is n- is not the responsibility of the vendor alone. Correct. Okay. You know, uh, a technology should be intuitive by nature. If somebody is out there building unintuitive technologies, that if that's even a word, you know, then shame on them. You know, that they, they should be building highly intuitive technologies. That's not the challenge here. The the, the challenge here is the change impact that an implementation of Workday is going to have on the business, but also on the users within the business too. And that's evidenced through through some of the some of the data, I guess, that's that's come out in the survey. Yeah, the, the very good, very good points. I, I think that and certainly corroborated, not just my opinion, but corroborated through the comments made by our respondents. You know, a lot of these folks have never gone through an experience like this before. They've either never gone through a transformation project, they've never gone through a technology implementation, or if they have, it's not been with a product, a modern product that can help drive and enable and kickstart a a thought shift within the business. So I, I think there's been a lot of hindsight 2020 from the standpoint of customers starting to realize that the product itself is really an enabler and it is not going to drive change on its own. It has to be implemented with a very clear intent and a clear definition of what those expectations are and then care and feeding after the fact to make sure that it's living up to that intent because that has a very real uh, dollar impact downstream from either a headcount perspective, scale perspective, Merger and acquisition perspective, there are real dollars at play. Yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting how various different um, organizations view view these implementations. You, you know, a lot of them do have a desire to implement technologies faster. Uh, you know, I, I know that you mentioned that before. The speed to value is important, um, but the evidence in in you know in the survey suggests that change is fundamental to this uh you know i mean 74 percent of of organizations said that um that they met their target adoption rates which we will come on to i'm not going to let you get away with that scott we're going to come back <laughs> on to that in a minute that 74 percent of the organization hit their uh, their target adoption rates and a lot of that was that uh, was attributed to the fact that they uh, employed external experienced change consultants and practitioners as part of those implementations right yeah so, yeah 
you know, it, it's it's proving that it's a critical, critical component to adoption success. Absolutely. 100% of the time that we engage in either product evaluation and selection or in any of our other service lines with either prospects or uh, customers, 100% of the time, change is a topic of discussion. I think over the last 10 years, it's 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 rounded out and it's not a concept anymore. It's actually real. People can touch it, feel it, make decisions against it um, if it's executed the right way. What's important to note there is that your your typical um, drivers of a project like this, whether it's a finance executive, whether it's an HR executive and their team of resources are not necessarily change experts, nor should they. Their job is to manage the administrative functions of what they do, partner with the business and make sure that that their core business and set of services is executing at a high level. So when you talk about digital transformation adoption from a change perspective around a specific product, it's natural that you would seek outside help to, to drive that. There are experiences and lessons learned that come along with it that can help, especially in a speed to value situation, that can help drive that value faster. I think the other interesting component there, Andy, back to the back to the 19% a little bit. Um, we had a lot of people, when we executed this survey, it, it was not simply a, an online form that that we asked that we blindly emailed out and asked people to to fill in. We we actually engaged with them one on one in many, if not the majority of cases, face to face, and engaged in in deeper discussion outside of just the question. What's fascinating about that is we had quite a few respondents in, in, as you would imagine, probably in larger organizations that said their their definition of adoption changed as part of this initiative, as part of their initiative, where they used to think of adoption as product usage or sheer execution. What it's really become now is, did we execute are we executing? Can we continue to execute or very quickly get to execute with intent? So as an example, if I'm rolling manager employee self-service to my organization, can I see that the managers are actually initiating and completing the processes that they are assigned to or is someone in a support role having to do that on their behalf? That's a very telling metric. Um, in a stabilized state, because it tells you whether those support resources are being freed up to do other things or or not. They're having to still support managers, employees, et cetera. That may not have been the intent of the initiative. So, you know, the good news about that is we're to a point now where we can take a look at metrics like that and, and prescribe actions and corrective behaviors. And a lot of that just really comes back to in messaging around your training in such a way that the purpose of a project like this is really understood from top to bottom. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have been smiling like the Ches- Cheshire Cat since <laughs> since you uh, you started talking about users beginning to look at different ways of measuring adoption. Uh, Scott, you know, from from our perspective, uh, we've been saying this now since 2011. You know, a usage is not adoption. More and more organisations are starting to look at, at different metrics that. You know that uh, that contribute to that to that measurement uh, in the early days of implementations, and I'm sure that you know some of the organisations that have taken part in this survey were, were implementing Workday for the first time. It might have even been their first digital transformation uh, project, and as a result, they're going to look at adoption just purely as task completion but quality has to come into it. And a lot of the time, when you know when I speak to to, to businesses. I ask them to focus on the end game first. So I, I, I'll say, look at what you want to achieve. Look at the business case that you put together and then look at how you measure the success of, of hitting that business case. And adoption will have a significant contributing factor to that number. Uh, you know, I even you know go as far as saying that adoption measurement should be considered as part of the business case. If I if if I only ch- achieve 50% adoption of a, of a specific transformation, then I'm only going to get 50% of the value. 
You know, I can't expect to hit my, you know, to, to achieve and realize all of the benefits from my business case if I'm, if I'm, you know, my people are not truly adopting, uh, you know, adopting the, the technology for what it's worth. So, you know, it does, it, 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 it's great to hear that because I know that in the survey it references a number of times the, the target adoption rate. Um, specifically, as, as you mentioned, around the 19% who said that they, they that they didn't achieve that. But a lot of that was uh, was down to them not uh, considering change management properly, which is clear evidence in black and white that 19% that didn't achieve the adoption that they wanted was down to ineffective change management and a lack of investment uh, also in change management. That's what came out in the survey. Am I correct. 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 And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, you know, Andy, the HCM and finance um, is a unique situation. And I, I think for so long, change and adoption has been put on the back burner because there is a real financial impact in both of those functions um, from a system perspective if people aren't using the product. You know, so it's either pay or, or expenses or posting numbers on a monthly basis from a finance perspective, usage is driven to some degree because there is a financial component of those two modules or functions. So I think that has somewhat cast a shadow over real adoption. What what firms are starting to realize now is with these scaled back staff operating on, on very thin budgets, they have to rethink the way their administrative staffs or their back office staffs are functioning. And the only way to do that is to have clear goal at the very beginning, communicate that effectively among the, the core team, continually reminding the core team of those objectives and allowing them to be champions, not only from a system design perspective, but from an implementation and a communication path throughout the project. So I know a lot of a lot of people look at change or adoption and they think simply about training and comms in the last month prior to go live, or they think simply in terms of employees and managers. I, I know you'll agree with this, but I, I couldn't disagree with that more. Change really starts in the embryonic stages of a transformation project. And it really starts with a core team and then filters out to employees and managers, not the other way around. So waiting until the last moment or waiting until you get to some sort of user acceptance testing to really pay attention to change, I could argue, and I think our survey results probably say the same thing, that that would be a mistake. Yeah, I mean, it's it's old thinking, to be to be brutally honest. It really is. It's the way that we used to implement on-premise technologies. You know, we, we used to think about purely about big bang change and then forget about it. The difference now is that um, is that SaaS cloud technologies, will ch- they change all the time. They evolve. That's why they're as a service. Um, and it's that constant change that uh, the, the organizations are coming unstuck on. So the the change in adoption space is the reason why, you know, um, the, you know thousands of people at HR Tech recently in Europe uh, were going crazy about adoption is that it is twofold. One, it's not easy. Two, it has a direct effect on the return on investment that you get from from investments in in trans, in digital transformation and um you know we are seeing more organizations looking at tools and solutions to to address these issues but purely focusing on trying to roll out modern cloud SaaS technologies in the same way we used to roll out old on premise ones is is not really going to cut it C- correct correct and i think i think any the other thing that's interesting in this and we 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 see a lot of this um as these product vendors start to focus more on on some of the smaller, not not necessarily the twenty five thousand plus, not necessarily the ten thousand employee size plus, but really in that five thousand and below employee range, a lot of these organizations are moving from outsourced administrative functions and pulling it back in. So this is really not just product wise, but from a subject matter expertise internal business process, all the way around this is a shift in thought for them. So that's where the service delivery component spans in. That's where the multiple projects span in from an overarching program management. It's typically not in in a transformation like this, one particular uh, product that's being implemented, it's multiple. And so all of those things fit in and drive that change. So it's it's really got to be a 
a well-oiled machine to get the most value out of that product that you possibly can. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. The, the, to think and to think of these projects like we used to, um, 15, 20 years ago from on-prem solutions is, is uh, short selling the changes and the way business has evolved. Um, projects have evolved. A lot of the risks that are out there today are probably the same risks that were there 10 years, 15, 20 years ago, but the way to solve or mitigate those risks has changed. Yeah. I mean, I would even go as far as saying that actually the change impact is, is amplified um, slightly. And, and the reason why I would I would make that case, Scott, is because, you know, these technologies are more accessible than they ever were before. You know, they're, they're, I speak to Workday customers all the time who say, look, we, you know, we, we're, we're investing heavily in Workday Mobile. Uh, it's a big part of our strategy. Um, and, you know, we, we need, you know, we basically we need your support uh, in helping uh, our users adopt that. And it is, uh, you know, th- th- that in itself wasn't around. You know, you couldn't access, um, you know, some of the on-prem technologies through your mobile device years uh, years ago. So I think that not only are the, you know, not only a practitioners underestimating the change impact, um, and that's evidenced through the survey, which I think is tremendous. That it's that it's pointed out that change has a massive part to play, not only in adoption but also in uh, in the return on investment from 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 these uh, these implementations. Um, but also that organizations are, are underestimating the the impact that that these that these transformations are going to have to their organization, um, mainly because of uh, you know the size and the scale of of that. One thing that I'm doing, you know, a cheeky plug here is that I'm actually running um, the next the next season of our uh, of our podcasts uh, is is focused in and around what we call the six pillars of digital adoption. And that really gets into the nuts and bolts of what is adoption. And the biggest uh, sort of uh, fail, really, if you like, for most organizations is they, they think that adoption is are people using the technology. And uh, interestingly, I ran, I ran a workshop recently with one of the largest hotel organizations in the world, actually. And we, we, we benchmarked where their adoption challenges sort of lay, if you like, against these six pillars. And the six pillars were, has, has there been a change of strategy, a change of culture, a change of behaviors, a change of processes, a change of skills, and a change of software? And interestingly, 75% of their adoption problems were related to the first five pillars and had nothing to do with the software. Yeah. And what that shows us is that actually, you know, if 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 you're if you're putting all of your dollars into, yeah, let's just throw it in, tell people they need to use it, or let's have some point and click tools that will show them where they, you know, areas of the system that they need to click on when they need to click on it, that you're just not going to achieve your ROI because 75% of your adoption challenges lay in 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 pillars that are outside of the software. Um, and that's and that's th- that links back to the to the change impact. Most organisations don't don't look at well, this is going to impact you know culturally. This is going to impact you know from a process uh, and a, a behavioural standpoint, for example. Yeah, that those are those are great comments, um, Andy. I, I I also think to play off of that just a little bit. You know, we had we definitely had a, a lot of respondents that said, hey, we knew. When, when we signed up for this, that we were going to move fast. And so we've looked at this as a multi-step process. And, and I, I want to come back to that in a few moments, but I'll stay on the adoption change path for, for, for right now. Um, we, we knew that first and foremost, we had to get the technology in play, we needed to get it live. We know that, there, that that will drive at least a minimal amount of change, but we what we would like to do is once it's live, we will stabilize and then assess and maybe go through a different um, set of initiatives from a from a softer non-system related transformation as a phase two or as a phase three. I think the question becomes, and, and we're, we're not really deep enough from a life cycle perspective, specifically around Workday, to see a high volume of folks that are three years, six years, eight years deep, and have they been able to 
move into phase two, phase three, phase four, and drive different behavior. I think more often than not, probably what you're going to find is a lot of the same behaviors that you found with on-prem. Once they stabilize, they tend to fall into a pattern of behavior and they don't go back to that. So, you know, we, we like to say at KSI, your best opportunity is to strike while the iron's hot while you're going through an initiative like this. Pay attention to it. Spend the little bit extra that it costs to get professional help around this, drive it as much as you can at the very beginning because you're going to save in the long run and your expense is going to be less up front than it is in a stable state because you're going to have more change after you stabilize, uh, mainly because you may have to go back and reconfigure or reintroduce another technology wave uh, from a configuration perspective. So I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you completely. It, it will be interesting to see those that choose to simply move to a technology without focusing on this. Are they able to pick back up and really drive change and drive transformation after the fact? I, I think that that's a really interesting um, debate. Really, really interesting debate. And I was actually uh, thinking about that the other day uh, whilst lying in bed because um, I'm a loser and I have nothing else to do but think about digital transformation whilst at home. And what I'm seeing, we're seeing two things here, aren't we? We're seeing a scenario where organisations are investing in change management pre-go live and it's working. It's, it's delivering value. We're seeing organizations that are, that are not investing in, in change pre-go live. And actually, um, I, I know three Workday customers that, that we're working with at the moment that have said that they're actively embarking in post-go live optimization uh, exercises. And um, I know Forrester recently, uh, they, they recently released a, a report about um, organizations having to spend between $1 and $4 post-go live to optimize the adoption and ultimately the value they get from digital transformation. Because as you say, you know, um, you have to reconfigure, you need to optimize processes, you need to encourage people to adopt them properly. Um, and I guess the question is, is do I spend the money pre-go live? Uh, or do I spend the money post go live? But ultimately, I'm going to have to spend money because currently, to date, there are there are very few cases of organisations that have just managed to adopt uh, digital transformation by osmosis and ultimately deliver hugely effective uh, processes as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. That uh, you actually, it's funny, Andy. You teed me up for my next one, and, and, <laughs> and I think you didn't even know it. Maybe I did. <laughs> so one of the other fascinating, I promise I'll, I'll pull this back around. I, I'm going to go a little bit left and then I'll come right back to the center. Um, one of the other fascinating metrics that we saw through our survey was that 71% of the respondents said they met their target go live. There's a lot of different ways to unpack that, that number. The intent of the question was really at contract date, when you first embarked upon this at contract date before you had met with an implementation partner, before you had gone through any type of design, before you had gotten into any uh, testing situations, et cetera, did you meet that initial target go live? 71% said yes. That leads to the second point there, or the naturally to the second question. You mean 29% did not. There are a multitude of reasons behind that. And I think it ties back a lot to change, but of many, 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 and I think it's probably greater than 71%, many of these projects go through a reforecast of scope and time component at some point during their initial launch. The reason for that is it's extremely difficult to understand, and, and I'm using the word intent again, so my apology. But it's extremely difficult when scoping a, a project like this to understand true intent, to understand internal change capabilities, even within even within a decision making team that's buying the product. What is the real intent of the program or the initiative from the onset? And as as implementation partners, product partners, um, external consultants really start to dig in. They start to un un uncover things, whether it's capacity, subject matter expertise, lack of communication, slow decision making, the list goes on. It's, it's all in the survey uh, results. But they start to uncover, for lack of a better word, I'll use opportunities 
that force the timeline or scope to potentially slide. So the research that you that you mentioned a few moments ago, I think around optimization speaks very much to, I don't believe that a lot of these projects are necessarily going against target go live at time of contract. I think there's a, nego- a new negotiated go live and probably a new negotiated scope at some point, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so optimization after initial launch could mean many different things. It could mean the completion of initial intended scope, or it could mean we misinterpreted what we thought our business process should be, and now we need to go back and fill in the gaps or fill in some holes. I think a big component of that optimization also needs to be what was our messaging, what were we expecting Or were we just implementing a replacement from a technology perspective? And now that we've done that, should we be developing a core message that can drive behavior? And that should be part of the optimization. Well, I think you just teed me up uh, perfectly because we're going to find out because those three companies are actively actually on our um, our next podcast, uh, which is on post go live optimization of digital transformation so we're going to delve into that in in some detail and i'm really interested to to listen to that and listen to what these practitioners are saying as to why they've embarked on these on these specific programs of activities and as you say scott some of that might be you know uh sort of recalibrating or or re-implementing scope that was cut back in 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 earlier stages it also may be to do with uh, improving processes or or you know actually actively tacking tacking in low adoption of uh, of those key processes right. um i think um from my perspective i just want to summarize really you know my thoughts from what i got from the survey uh from for the listeners and i you know just a, at a real sort of helicopter view you know cutting through everything pulling it all the way up to the top i think i just want to sort of my my put my stance on it from what i saw from the survey i think that Workday, it's clear that Workday is uh, is a tremendous tool. You know, the satisfaction uh, metrics were, were evident and customers were ultimately satisfied with the tool. Um, they did like the UI and the, and the UX, although uh, some of the adoption metrics actually uh, referred to or uh, implicated the fact that something wasn't quite right. And I think that we've done a good job of identifying the fact that that's because... Um, adoption is is more than just about can I can I use this tool or can I not? The other thing I guess is that uh, that change has a massive part to play in success. I think that is completely evident. You know, if you if you uh, read the survey, you'll see that change has a huge part to play, and not only um, you know successful execution of you know of good change programs, but also hiring in exper- external expertise. That, that has done this before for Workday. Workday will have its specific nuances, but it was clear that some of the percentages of organizations actually uh, attributed uh, the success of their projects heavily to external change support. Also, on the program, uh, you know, the actual program management side of things, it was clear that most of the more successful organizations had well-structured pro- uh, program management uh, practices or, or even used external program management organizations to to you know to affect the implementation of their project and, and those were more successful rather than those who didn't and ultimately uh, I guess at the end of the day there is some room for improvement um, there always is and uh, I think organizations are learning over time we see that the 19 uh, percent of, of organizations there that have had less successful, um, implementations per se or, or, or adoption rates as, as it says in the statistic um, I suspect that you know those 40 organizations and that that's what it, it represents 19 percent is 40 organizations out of the 213 I suspect that if we were to survey them and perhaps we should 
it will come down to uh, you know a myriad of different challenges that they've faced but those are the ones that organizations would like to learn from that are listening to this podcast you know what are the gotchas what are the things that went well what are the things that could have gone better um you know ultimately to try and create this this perfect blueprint of how to not only implement digital transformation quickly and achieve high adoption but also sustain that over time as well yeah that that that's a good summary andy i i think um the other message that i would like to convey to the listeners is um, change change has become tangible now whereas i think before it was very theoretical and, and people had their had a very hard time defining what it meant how to measure it how to put mitigating plans in place uh to reduce risk it, it, it's actually tangible today so I, I don't think buyers need to be um, as scared of change consulting, program management consulting, service delivery consulting as maybe they were 10 years ago. What I would say, minimal investment up front and attention at the right points of, of your transformation effort. You can take those middle and minimal investments a long way and really mitigate risk. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in risk management. Everything that we have internally from a delivery perspective is built on risk mitigation to attain target go lives, to attain target scope, to attain target budget, et cetera. Um, and, and I service delivery and change management and attention to those two components um, because they go hand in hand very early always pays benefits. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. I, I think to finish, um, what I would say is that you know, if we look at change, it, it effectively, you know, the end game for, for change is, is, a, is a focus on true adoption of, uh, of this digital transformation. And, um, you know, what I would encourage users to do from, from what I've seen and also what is evidenced in this specific uh, survey is, is to consider adoption right at the forefront of when you're looking to invest in a technology like this. It has to be a stream. It has to be part of your business case. If your business case assumes 100% of a, 100% adoption, then you're in big trouble. Um, so let's leave on that point. But Scott, I will say thank you in one second, but just for the listeners, um, when will this survey be available? How do they get it? How do users get, get hold of a, a copy of this? Yeah, thank you, Andy. So we will be uh, issuing a press release directing folks to our website on uh, next Friday, which I believe is the 16th, 16th of February. Of February. Um, and it, yeah, it'll be freely available. You can download. There, there's no need to register or, or sign up for, for, for any marketing emails or, or anything along those lines. You can certainly go out and, uh, and download that. And I would also like to offer for those listeners that that are interested and in potentially participating in a deeper dive survey um, please reach out to me I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to conduct those interviews or, or get our team to conduct those interviews there are several points uh, within our survey that I, I think if we drill down two or three levels deeper with the right roles that participated in projects like this there's a lot more telling information that will come out and, and round this out even more so um, please feel free to reach out. You can contact us through the website and, and we're happy to get back to you. Amazing. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we, we're going to move on to onto the last section now. And uh, Scott, this is just for fun. So I'm going to throw this straight at you. And, you know, I'm interested in to hear, to hear your specific responses to some of these questions, but we like to do this. Uh, with everybody that we that we uh, invite onto an Apple M podcast, just some questions for fun. Um, so first off, we're going to shoot away with them. Um, what do you have in your pocket right now? <laughs> um, nothing. Absolutely nothing. You have nothing in your pocket. No, I have lint <laughs> in my pocket right now. You should at least put your hand in there. Yeah, I have my hand in my pocket now. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, at least there's something in there. Um, yeah. Most people say a phone. No, I don't have. Anything. You know, I've, I've got a phone. I've got a wallet. I've got a card. You know, you, this guy. You don't even carry a phone or a wallet. It's, it's amazing. It's all in my backpack. <laughs> Okay, and question number two, um, if you could go back and give yourself some advice when you were starting your career, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I, I think it would be to, to take the time 
um, regularly on a recurring basis to reflect on your experiences and try and understand other people's perspectives and how it shaped those experiences. And, and, and I say that because I think as you grow and you get older, your understanding of those experiences and other folks' perspective grows as well. And so where you may have considered something very early in your career, maybe a bad experience and maybe detrimental, et cetera, as you grow, you can start to understand that experience a little bit better and, and probably understand and recognize that it was positive. Oh, that's a great answer. It's a great answer. Okay, question number three. If you were stranded on a desert island, what two people would you like to have with you? Mm. Well, my wife, first and foremost. Good answer. Safe answer. Like that, Scott. You went with the safe answer. Well, that's not just safe. That's true. The second would be anybody that knows how to survive on a desert island. <laughs> <laughs> You've because, overthought about this. You've overthought this. Yeah, stuff. because I don't think my <laughs> wife or I would last very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, well, that's, that's, a very, that's a very, very interesting answer there. Okay, from your perspective, what is the best an invention ever? Oh, that's an easy one, Andy. I live in Texas, so it's air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I live in England, so it's an umbrella. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't built for heat. <laughs> we weren't built for rain, but we have to put up with it all of the time. Yeah. Um yeah. what who who's had the biggest impact on your career? Final question, who's had the biggest impact on your career? My wife by far. Uh she's always been supportive, always trusts from a decision-making perspective um where my head's going and where I'm leaning. Um but but very good from the standpoint of of making sure I'm considerate of others. And and we team very well. We 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 problem solve very well as long as um, I do what she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I can empathize with that. I can empathize with that. That's a really good. Yeah, well, I have I have I have three daughters as well, so I'm surrounded, Andy. I I do what I'm. You're doing. outnumbered. You're outnumbered, Scott. It's um yeah. that's a great point to to end on. I just want to say a huge thank you to you for joining the podcast. Um, you know, I was really looking forward to speaking to you. I always do look forward to speaking to you, especially given the fact that you're straight down the line, um, which is great because you know where you stand. And also that honesty um, is something that a lot of people uh, feed off when they're, you know, when they're considering, you know, some of the projects that they're implementing themselves or the, the journeys that uh, on which they're about to embark. So thank you for your time on the podcast and I wish you all the best for 2018. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Uh, as always, you can find um, all of the podcasts that we create here at AppLearn across our various different social channels and also on AppLearn.com. Please feel free to share and distribute the podcast and any feedback would be more than welcome. If you would like to participate in a future AppLearn podcast, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.